required multiplier to it instead of doing multiplier steps. We did that because our partner in the States, VLSI Technology, had a synthetic benchmark that in our view foolishly emphasized the value of having high performance multiplies. <laughs> but it was much easier to spin the chip and the extra 2,000 transistors that the hardwired multiplier took than to argue with them. So we did that. So in 1987-1988, these machines started appearing on the marketplace, all based on that general circuit diagram. Um, and obviously these machines were horrendously powerful. Um, they had main memory buses that ran at 8 megahertz on sequential DRAM cycles, 4 megahertz on non-sequential. So their peak memory bandwidth was 32 megabytes per second. So 16 times more memory bandwidth than the BBC machine had, 8 times more memory bandwidth than a language processor had. And they were correspondingly fast. These machines were the fastest machines that anybody in the UK could buy. Um, Cambridge University discovered these things very early on as a language processor, the BBC machine, and that they could write things like prolog compilers and move all their um, natural uh, language theory computing stuff from whatever mainframe it had been when you were on the time, IBM C7165, to ARMS. So, you know, big change. As we're running on a multi million pound mainframe, now running on a thousand pound home computer. It was good. So, driving ourselves on, the story about how the memory performed made us take the next step. At this time, everybody's machines uh, were limited by main memory bandwidth. There were no on-chip caches. Mainframe machines had big on-chip, uh, on-main PCB caches, but nothing was on-chip. Um, the, the caches on a mainframe's main um, processor board were simply there so that they could have slower speed out to their memory systems. So on 3 we decided to put the uh, uh, cache right onto the chip. So this was a mixed instruction data cache, it was 4 kilobytes in size, with 64-way uh, set associative, um, with random replacement. Um, an ARM chip, an ARM3 chip, would run in the region of 16 to 25 megahertz. So, as it were, its main memory bandwidth was much the same as an ARM2. We didn't change the, the main system design, but what it saw through its cache upped its performance by another factor of three or four compared with where we were. So these machines were beginning to get seriously powerful. We still had an interest in the um, low-end computer market, so since we were now getting quite good, every single one of these chips had been right first time. Um, we made a chip called the ARM250, uh, what we thought of as a computer on a chip. We took the ARM, the I.O. controller, the video controller, and the memory controller, and integrated them all together on a single chip. We produced a, a range of chips, the A3010, 3020, 4000. We then produced another chip, a ARM7500, which had more like an ARM3 on chip, so it was um, the big cache on the chip as well. And that produced more powerful machines still, and then in the end we produced one ARM7500 FE with hardware 30 point on chip too. So that was a, a lineage of machines. I'm avoiding very carefully saying a particular word about those machines because I'll come back to it. So we've lived with the original ARM system architecture for a very long time. Uh, in 1994, we introduced a new set of capabilities. We replaced the I.O. controller, memory controller, video controller part of it um, with uh, uh, IOMD, VIDC, and the memory controllers vanished into the ARM610. The ARM610 was the first ARM to be produced with an on-chip memory controller and cache. The ARM610 was also produced for Apple, because by this time, ARM had spun out of Acorn into a company owned by Acorn, Apple, 
and we will our technology to provide chips for all of us. So the RISPC took our expandability uh, mantra to heart. We could now replace our processor and as the ARM architecture evolved, we got the ARM 610, the ARM 710, so we had 40 megahertz processors and the strong ARM 200 megahertz processor. Um, we could also plug in an X86 card, and we had a system on chip to transform the uh, X86 bus to the internal Acron bus, and we could run uh, PC programs on this machine directly as well. So I mentioned a bit, we've been making the R610 for ARM. This is the, the famous Newton, the machine that was ultimately reviled. Set up ARM to do this. Uh, it replaced the machine, the, the microprocessor that Apple had contracted with um, AT&T to build for the Hobbit. And ARM were able to produce a better, cheaper, faster, um, lower power chip. And uh, an ARM chip is at the bottom. So now the words that I carefully not mentioned. Systems on chip. When we made the ARM 250 by integrating together everything, we finally had the world's first system on chip, a complete computer. All your cell phones are systems on chip. Um, there was a reason why we were the first people to do this. ARM was a tiny processor. This picture on the right is it's an ARM 750, ARM 7500. So the, the, in the top left, about a third of the way across, and about ooh, a sixth of the way down, is an ARM 7 core. The rest of the chip is the, the, the 4K cache, cache tags, memory controller, um, video controller, I, big video palette. The video palette's almost as big as the main cache. LCD controller, memory controller on the right. Everything that you need build a computer is in this ARM 7500. So ARM was a small processor and SOCs built with ARMs were much more successful. Building a system on chip at all was hard in the process technology at the time. Um, with a small ARM you had much more room for other components. And so the people who are most interested in that, apart from Apple building new, were mobile phone companies. So ARM captured all the mobile phone business just by being small and doing systems on chip before anybody else in the world. And as a result of being in there, and as a result of the fantastic business model that Robin Snatchby at ARM invented, um, ARM now dominates the global mobile uh, embedded processor market. So we've now shipped over 10 billion ARM processors. Um, the modern arms that are shipped in high volumes are things like ARM 9 and ARM 11, so about 100,000 transistors in the processor, ignoring any memory. So if you multiply 10 billion by 100,000 transistors average for these parts, that's 10 to the 15 transistors, which is the number of synapses in just one single human brain. And this year we're shipping 1 billion arms a quarter, um, next year it we will expect that we will ship 6 billion arms in the year. That's one for every person on the planet. So um, the question the slide asks you is, have you bought your arm yet? You'll have to buy one arm every year for the next foreseeable future. Then a couple of years time you'll have to buy two or three a year just to keep up. <laughs> There's a, another interesting thing in these numbers. There are other processors that have shipped tens of billions. Um, TI have uh, a range of very small 8-bit and 4-bit embedded machines, TMS 1000 and things like that. They have shipped 10 billion of those as well. But ARM is the most powerful thing that's shipped so many. So the awe-inspiring calculation is that ARM by itself has more MIPS attached to it uh, as a combination of its general power and the, the, the sheer volume of it, that all the other processors on the planet put together. <laughs> there are more arm in the world than anything else.